I was over at a girlfriend's house and um, we we're talking about the theater and, and her mother mentioned Harold Pinter and uh, uh, I said, uh, well, who's Harold Pinter? And she looked at me and she said, Des, if you're gonna call yourself a playwright, you're gonna have to know who Harold Pinter is. He's been called a wunderkind by Newsweek magazine for his audacious theatrical productions, which have included Jersey Boys and The Who's Tommy, as well as many others. He's also produced and directed two vastly different motion pictures, one based on Balzac, the other based on Rocky and Bullwinkle. After a couple of decades as artistic director in La Jolla, California, he took over the Stratford Festival in southern Ontario. And that's where we caught up with Des Mackinough on his return to remount Tommy. Des, you know, I'm reading about your early life, and it occurred to me as I was looking at, uh, at your, your, your youth, your youth, that you could have just, it could have just been rock and roll as, as well as theater, couldn't it? Um, you know, what happened to me uh, with rock and roll is I was, I was in a bar uh, one night. I was about 18, and they just, uh, I, I, they lowered the, the, uh, the drinking age just as I hit 18, which was very good of them. I, <laughs> I deeply appreciated it, and I was in a bar, and playing in the bar was a, a guy that I'd really admired uh, throughout my teens, who'd been in a band called The Power, a guy named uh, uh, E.G. Smith, Grant okay. Smith, <clears throat> and he was basically kind of doing a covers in a band, and this guy had a song on the charts, and you know, he was, he was a very, very talented kind of rhythm and blues white soul front man. Right. And I thought to myself, uh, this guy is a much more talented front man than I could ever hope to be. And if he's ended up this quickly playing in bars, <laughs> okay. I, I don't think it's the, you know, the career I want to <laughs> The pursue. career tra trajectory is like that. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you happen to be, you know, Pete Townsend uh, or Robbie Robertson, uh, you know, Toronto boy who made good. Yeah then, uh, you know, maybe you can have a remarkable life. <laughs> but I think for the rest of us, you're, you're, we're better <laughs> off probably choosing alternatives. And the theater came along uh, for me uh, because of hair. And uh, really, I mean, I was doing uh, other uh, shows in, in, in school, but I considered those shows to be my parents' shows. You know, Annie Get Your Gun, <laughs> right, Sound okay. of Music, Pajama right. Game. I didn't really have any deep relationship with them. Uh, now, I think I've come to respect them much more, you know, now that I've, I've done some, uh, some classic musicals, now I have a different attitude. But in, at that point, it, it had nothing to do with the music I was listening to right. or playing or, I, you know, that I cared about. So, you know, ha happily, the, 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 you know, electric, the first electric musical, I and mean, there were several, but that, that was the one that, that you know, kind Did of it got, you. caught my attention. Yeah. And, uh, I'm very grateful to those guys. In fact, I just saw um, uh, one of them, the, the surviving one, uh, uh, recently at, at, at a Broadway theater and, and made a big deal about how he'd you know, kind of changed from yeah. like James Rado. Well, th there you were out in, I mean, <coughs> you, were in, you, you were raised essentially in Scarborough, yes, in, in Scarberia, as yeah. it's known. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, I can say that you can. And I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Canadian from, from the too? east, so I know. Right, yeah, right, I've had well, friends who who are pretty sensitive about that Scarberia stuff. <laughs> who, okay, who I'll, lost I'll their teenage was there? Yeah, all right, but, but but tell me about it though, because it's, it would seem that uh, of all places in sort of you know middle class suburban Canada, that you would, that it's hard to imagine getting your, having your passions fired there in that in those surroundings. <clears throat> Well, I, I, I owe a lot to many people for, uh, I suppose, opening my eyes to um, Canadian culture and to, you know, music and art in general. Uh, one of them it was the, uh, our graphic designer here in the 50s, Eric Aldwinkle, <coughs> and I'm related by marriage, I was related by marriage to Eric, and, and uh, he came into my life when I was about 10 and living in Scarborough and I would go down to his studio in Rosedale and hang out on the weekends and, and he essentially 
uh, began my education in the arts and taught me color and taught me music. Okay. And, and, uh, and then I happened to go to a high school, Woburn Collegiate Institute, <clears throat> which was growing at a ridiculous rate. I think it was somewhere, I'm making this up, around 900 students when I got there in ninth grade. And by the time I left, it was 2,300 students. Okay, yeah. And it was a very rich music scene. In fact, I'll tell you something very strange. I was in a band there in, in the you know, late 60s called, it was called Many Things, but it was, for the, it was called Isaac for a fair, relatively long period of time, okay. like maybe nine months. Okay. And uh, I was telling somebody yesterday about playing a, a, a gig in Beaverton, Ontario, where I managed to pulverize myself with a t tambourine. I don't know why this particular night it occurred to me that I would... <laughs> Mainly play tambourine. I played guitar it's usually quite a the, bit. Usually, the chick in the band who plays the tambourine. You yeah, know? Exactly. <laughs> you know, and Jag, I think I'd probably seen Jagger do something right. fancy with a tambourine. And anyway, I I just ended up with this bruise on my leg the next morning that was that looked like an Easter egg, and it was yellow and purple because I'd been just bashing myself with this aluminum tambourine. And we were very I don't know how good we were, but we were incredibly loud. We used to borrow equipment to try to outdo each other, you know, who could show up with the, you know, more amplifiers or more speaker cabinets. At any rate, I get out of the blue yesterday a note from our keyboard player, Ross Beatty, <laughs> telling me about an album that Mike Richmond, our guitar player in that band, had just recorded. They got to be about 60 now, too. And uh, Augie Ogborn, our drummer, is the drummer on this. And this is going back now. Well, that's well over. Uh, See, now you 40, could have been 40 years the legendary ago. tambourine player. I could have been doing the playing. I could have been on their album. And if I, that's true. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the uh, it, I, I went to school with a lot of really talented yeah. people, and we had a great teacher in the theater arts department, a guy named John Wilcox, who sadly enough is gone now, and uh, he was really encouraging. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't be sitting here without him. He, yeah. he I basically went to him. I going into my last year of high school and said, uh, I'm going to write the, uh, a show. I'm going to write a, a, a musical because I'd been doing the hair thing. And, and, I, and I said, uh, if I write this, will you do it? They were supposed to do, uh, I think it was Maine they were going to do the next <laughs> okay. year. And I said, would you, know, would you consider doing this instead of Maine? And he said, absolutely, not believing for a second that I would do this. And like all writers, I you know, managed to piss away the first three or four weeks of the summer. <clears throat> and then at a certain point, the penny dropped, and I started to write. And I showed up at the beginning of September with, you know, 23 songs and, and a, a script for about a two-and-a-half-hour show. And he was kind of stuck. So did, you find it, did you find that easy to do once you started, when, once the, the, you got past the block? Was it, did it just sort of come pouring out? Was it natural? You know, I, I think I was really precocious, and uh, I didn't know it was difficult. Mm. And when you don't know something's difficult, right. you're more kind of inclined to leap into the pool. Um, so, I, 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 you know, I, I think it was actually quite naive. Uh, however, I knew something about um, the structure of musicals because I'd done these traditional shows, and uh, I guess I also had a certain amount of courage because of hair. I knew that, you know, one could use an electric score. I knew something of an underscoring and, and uh, you know, from, from having just observed these other shows. And uh, so I at least understood the, the basic building blocks, the basic units that had to go into a musical. I knew that you wanted to go from a duet to a solo to a choral, chorus number and so on. And like all composers, I had a lot of songs in the trunk. You know, I had, I'd had songs that I'd been writing since I was in my early teens. Okay. And some of them, and this always happens, fit in. You know, on the Who's Tommy, about half the songs were written before Tommy and were written for other purposes. Right. Um, and so I, I guess instinctively I knew that that was okay and didn't feel guilty about it. Um, and so I probably wrote, you know, 12 or 13 new songs and had 10 
that you know were, were uh, uh, some that we played in the band, and some yeah. went back to my days. In so this this gets clothes. mounted, right? It gets, yeah, it got, it, yeah, it got, got mounted. mounted. Yeah. So we, the, you remember your we feelings? We recorded an album. Really? Yeah. Okay. So you still, which is still around. Yeah. Do you, still, do you remember your feelings show. at the time when the, when your first show got mounted? Was it you thought was it like uh, this is it, man? This is all I this is all I want to do. You know. I, I suppose that's true. I, 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 I think I kind of backed into the theater. I, I, I'm not sure going into that show, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and and in, a, in a sense, it was, a, I, I suppose, I look at it now as a kind of a happy accident. Uh, but once I'd uh, written and composed this show, I, I, I really couldn't imagine doing anything else. But, you know, that's not the most important moment, of course. It, it's... The most important moment uh, in any artist's uh, development is the moment of humility. It's not the moment of arrogance. Um, and the moment of humility was very simple. I, I was over at a girlfriend's house, and um, we're talking about the theater, and, and her mother mentioned Harold Pinter. And uh, uh, I said, uh, well, who's Harold Pinter? And she looked at me, and she said, Des. If you're going to call yourself a playwright, you're going to have to know who Harold Pinter is. Ooh, and, um, you know, that was a great, uh -huh. great, that was an epiphany. I, I just want, you know, you're right. I am uh, not being sincere. I'm not being honest with myself here. I, I, I know nothing. What I don't know about the theater could fill the Encyclopedia Britannica. And so I got busy, and I started going down the road to... Uh, uh, the library there on, uh, uh, you know, on uh, uh, Lawrence and Markham Road, and and I spent my days, you know, in the library, and I read everything I could get my hands on, yeah. and essentially started my own education there, and started seeing all the shows I could see in Toronto. Yeah. And, and you and were going, you were at Ryerson, though you didn't finish. You left before. Was it because of that? I mean, it was because you thought, well, this is I'm spinning my wheels here. I could actually be out there doing this stuff. No, I I, I think it was a. a, a uh, again, it was the going flipping back to the arrogant side. Mm. Um, you know, I wrote the first year I was a theater student. I wrote four plays. Um, <clears throat> one that it's, I'd started in the summer before, and but I, I, I and I, I got a commission from uh, Susan Rubish at Young People's Theater, and I got a commission from Martin Kinch at Toronto Free Theater. Uh, but I'd written two other plays, you know, on my own and. They started getting produced. Uh, they started that summer, the summer after my first year. And I became a little bit overwhelmed with the um, responsibility and also uh, with the number of opportunities that seemed to be coming along, you know, at the CBC and, you know, for, in, in terms of writing and composing and other places as well, other, other theaters. And Jack McAllister, who was running the program, sat me down and said, look, you know, we, we understand what's going on with you, and we will um, kind of uh, design a program so that you can audit classes and give you the kind of freedom you're going to need to pursue these other projects. And uh, I tried it for a little bit and, and just couldn't make it work. And it was a... a Probably a damn stupid thing to do, you know. And and I'm very uh, appreciative to Ryerson for, you know, uh, years later, uh, you know, kind of recognizing my time there, uh, uh, recognizing that my time there was very important to me because yeah. it, indeed it was. Uh, but uh, I didn't manage to keep the young professional student thing going. In that one year, however, I studied under the great Basia Hunter, who is, is really and, and of course we 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 don't always pay all that, you know, close attention to our own history, but Basia Hunter, Hunter was really one of the great acting teachers um, of that time, and, you know, studied with Maria Uspenskaya, studied with Reinhardt, studied with uh, Michael Chekhov. I mean, she was the real deal. So even though I only got a year there, it, it was a, a year well spent, yeah. thank God for it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about going to New York. I mean, here you're, you're in this, this, it strikes me that the the profession that you have chosen is one that requires, and you've talked about arrogance and humility, and, but it seems to me that it's one that requires, on a, on a fairly consistent level, um, 
a degree of self-confidence that isn't necessarily required in a lot of other jobs. Uh, is that the case? So when you go to a place like New York, you know, you've got to have confidence in yourself that, uh, you know, I'm coming here and I'm, I'm going to be able to pull this off. You know, I, I had uh, uh, really a, a, a kind of sneak preview of New York the year before I moved. I had composed the music for the collected works of Billy the Kid, mm -hmm. of Michael Andache, uh, uh, you know, a book of, of, of poems. And uh, I, it was produced several, the score was used in several productions, and one of them happened to be in Washington, D.C. So on the way down, I, I stopped in New York. And, um, you know, I had a couple of experiences that were important to me. One, very simply, is I went to, a, I saw a play called The Mutilated uh, on, the, you know, West 4th Street. You know, I'm just looking through the Village Voice. I'm going to Tennessee Williams play I've never heard of. You know, that's got to be interesting. I'll go. And so I go, and just before curtain, a guy comes in that looks a lot like Tennessee Williams and sits down in front of me with three or four of his, uh, you know, boys in his entourage. And I'm thinking, that is Tennessee Williams, in fact. And we're alone in the theater. So I'm there, and Tennessee Williams is there, and there's and his boys, and there's nobody else. There's nobody else in the nobody audience? Else. And there's a performance. And he laughs at a lot of things that, you know, I'm not sure I quite understand. <laughs> but every so often, there would be this cackle. Uh, and uh, it was, I believe Carrie Nye was in that, too, Dick Cavett's okay. wife. Yeah. Anyway, I remember thinking, God, you know, if, if you had all the success you could imagine and became the most, one of the most play, important playwrights of your time, it might all end here. <laughs> like this. In an empty theater. Right. <coughs> with, um, so th that was a, a kind wow. of a, a, an important uh, moment, and, and I guess a moment that, that, that makes you... Uh, assess why you're doing what you're doing right. and that you're doing what you're doing because of your own needs and your own drive and it's not necessarily about the recognition of others and on that trip I felt quite strongly that the work we were doing in Toronto was very much as good as the work I was seeing in New York City mm. okay. and so when I moved there uh, and I moved there with the encouragement of certain friends. Peter Joban was huge because he'd lived there. And he just, he basically packed my bags and said, this, this is where you need to be. This is the next stage for you. I was 23 at that point. And, but I'd been working in Toronto for three or four years by, you know, at that stage. And so when I went, I'm not sure it was necessarily, um, you know, I suppose I had some confidence. I had mm -hmm. confidence, but... I wasn't, I think more importantly, I wasn't intimidated. Okay. So, so it wasn't uh, that scary for you, really? It wasn't that yeah. scary. And again, I got a, a job very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'm still working with Michael David to this day. That would have been the summer of 1976. And we still have, I don't know, maybe four or five projects together, including, yeah. you know, Jersey Boys and yeah. including Tommy. And, and so that, that relationship has lasted a, a long time. Um, and I also got, thank God I got in through uh, Ed Bolins, who was running a playwriting program at the Public Theater. I got in to meet Joe Bapp. Uh, Ed was, uh, had been Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. And uh, he read this play of mine at the recommendation of a wonderful off-Broadway legend named uh, Jeff Weiss that I befriended that summer. And uh, he read this play and said, this isn't, a, this isn't for here. This isn't for the young playwright program. This needs to go across the hall to you know to the big public, and he walked it across the hall, dropped it off at uh, Joe Papp? at Play Development, Joe Papp, and and so I I was you know that play was uh, uh, in uh, development there almost uh, a play called with the unlikely title of Leave It to Beaver Is Dead, yes, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that that happened. Uh, that summer. So in a way, I suppose I had reason not, you know, I was being encouraged. Yeah. yeah. And as Canadians, you know, it, it, it's not nor and it, this is still true today. <clears throat> it was particularly true during that youthful age. We had a, just an, a, 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 an extraordinary training ground with the alternative Toronto theater scene yeah. and John Hirsch uh, hiring young writers and directors for the CBC. And and um, so, in, in a sense, I, I, I don't think 
uh, the United States could compete with that. Yeah. You know, if I'd been 23 in New York City, I would I would have been lucky to get uh, you know yeah. a job assisting somebody, yeah. let alone you know yeah. getting plays yeah. produced and so on. And exactly. that had less to do with me as an individual than it did with the the I think vitality of the of the theater scene. Yeah. Tell me about La Jolla, because the 18 years you were the artistic director there, right? 18 years? How did, I, that, how did that come about? Yeah, I was actually there as artistic director for 18 years. Uh, we're uh, uh, celebrating uh, the, uh, the 30th season, so I've actually been involved with them for, for, uh, for 30 years, and I've served as artistic director of 18 okay. of those, and now I have the dubious title of director emeritus, or whatever the hell that means. <laughs> Um, it means it's, you're this far from death. It's usually I, what it that's means. what it usually means, but I, I, I feel too young for that, so I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope that's not what it means. Um, I, I, used to be, uh, I used to be adjunct professor, and I once looked up the, the definition of adjunct, and one of the, de my favorite definition is, is useless appendage. <laughs> uh, so there's got to be something that goes with emeritus that's like that. I haven't, I haven't looked into that yet. Um, and I was actually a uh, resident director when I didn't live there for five years, too, uh, under Michael Greif, my, uh, who, was, who has, was both my, my successor and my, and my predecessor, because I, I had two terms as artistic director then. Um, How did you end up there? You know, I, I, it's actually a very simple story. I, there was a guy named Arthur Bartow, who is now retired, who taught at NYU and was a real, very important, uh, maybe somewhat invisible force in the, in the alternate theater uh, scene or in, in the uh, Lord Theater the, the, uh, scene in, in America, the regional theater scene. And he had, um, he wrote a wonderful book called uh, Directors on Directing, which I, I think is just a, still a terrific book. And he did interviews with Joanne Acolytus and Peter Sellers and Lee Brewer and all kinds of people and interviewed me for that. And I. Uh, always thought he'd done such a great job on that book. I, you know, was a real admirer. And he kept calling me up and he'd say, "Would you come? God, there's this theater in Dallas that wants to interview you. Will you go?" And I, I always said no. And and sometimes they were just gigs too. You know, they yeah. want to do two gentlemen of Verona and Cleveland. You know, and they're looking for a director. Would you, would 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 you go? And uh, I and I I didn't go. And I finally had been on this bender work bender in New York and I was absolutely fried and he called and he said there's a theater in California and they're looking it's a brand new theater looking for an artistic director would you you know this time would you go and actually have a look and I I honestly had never heard of La Jolla and the only reason I went was because of Arthur I just felt you know sick about saying no every time and he was so persistent and I thought, well, this will be a chance just to duck out of New York. Because in those days, I, you know, 18 months would go by and I'd never leave the city. So I thought this is all a, a good thing. And I happened to get recommended the same trip by Joe Papp for a musical about Chaplin, about Charlie Chaplin, which was going to be in L.A. So it was all very convenient. And off I go, not expecting, you know, anything to happen. And I sit down with a search committee. And, and I had done a little bit of prep, you know, but uh, not too much, just a little bit you know, and ready for whatever questions they might have. And they basically said to me, the search committee, and some of these guys, the people are still friends, the, the two of them are still with us, and uh, they basically said, tell us your dreams. Describe your dream theater to us. And so I did. I described my dream theater. And the long and the short of it is, they said, we want to help you build that theater, create that theater. We want to help you. And when somebody says to you they're going to fulfill your dreams. Yeah, seriously. It's actually kind of hard to say no. You can't walk out of the room. <laughs> no. so, uh, so I took a couple of trips, and um, you know, I went back and forth a couple of times. Uh, they came to see I was doing a, a musical that I'd written or a play with music, like play with songs called The Death of Von Richthofen at the Public Theater, and they all came to see that. Um, so I thought, well, you know what you're buying into here. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm not going to be doing arsenic and old lace. <laughs> and, uh, or the nose trap. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, they, they, they knew what they were getting into, and I was also completely, hopelessly naive because. 
we were only supposed to operate for three months of the year. So my idea was, okay, I'll have a regular, you know, I, you know, I'm a fairly hard worker, so I thought, okay, I'll be able to, you know, uh, balance doing some work in New York and so on. And, uh, and that happened to, a, to some extent, but of course the job became all-consuming. Yes. And, and a startup theater, a clean sheet project like that in the 80s was very unusual. In fact, there are very few the other than Lincoln Center coming back to life, there are very, very few theaters that, that started up in that at that period. So it turned out to be, um, you know, a, a hell of a challenge. But uh, I'm extremely proud of it. Yeah, it's, it's, I bet. A, it's a wonderful institution. Yeah. It really is. We have a couple minutes left. I just wanted to ask you finally because you, you mentioned you know this this idea that you you know you're a hard worker and you talk about being fried at one point. If anybody was was to look at your schedule these days, it's hard to imagine how. You, I mean, you seem to be in in five different places at once, doing all of these things. Do, do you? It, you can still handle the load. Ob obviously, you can. But it seems to me that the older you get, the tougher it must be. I take a lot of naps. <laughs> that's that's the key. To taking a lot of naps is really important. I'll probably take one right now. <laughs> um, you know, I I, I think I'm. Um, fortunate in that I work with great people. And uh, again, I'm not intimidated by other artists. I want to work with mm -hmm. great artists. And, uh, um, and I also know that I depend on a certain kind of support structure. And I, so I think it comes down to efficiency, really. Uh, you, I think you can do, uh, a, a, an, uh, you can direct uh, an awful lot of projects if you're well organized and you're hard working and you have good collaborators. Um, you know, I've gone through periods in my career, actually after I directed my first show in New York, I think it was almost two years before I directed a second show. And I was very careful about what that next show was going to be. And in fact, it launched Dodger Theater, a, a, a play called Gimme Shelter. Um, but I, I wasn't happy, you know. I, I just it it, I, it 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 seemed uncharacteristically careful, you know, just too cautious, and um, so I I, I, I and I, perhaps a friend of mine accuses me of, of of not being able to say no, and I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, directing, you know, theater in general, it's it's like a dilettante's paradise because you can <laughs> move from you know, project to project and explore a completely different universe each time. And it's not necessary, you don't necessarily have to go into a project with a great deal of knowledge. You better come out of the project with a lot of knowledge. But, um, and so uh, I, I, I love to work. I, I, love, I love actors. Uh, I love theater artists, but I love actors. I love being in rehearsal. And, um, you know, and, and I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting better at it. <laughs> so, okay. You know. Well, it's good of you to, to, to uh, carve out this chunk of time for us. I appreciate it, given that schedule. Happy to do and it. And it's been great to meet you. Thanks a lot, Dad. Thank you. It's great. Okay. <laughs> good luck to your son. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, he wants to be an actor. I'm so screwed. <laughs> <laughs>